All right, Pat, you got it? Yeah, welcome. Welcome to Pod with PT. I'm Patrick. I'm Tyler. And this week we got on Dr. Anthony Amante from Connecticut, was our classmate back at Sacred Heart. So thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course. So typically, well, we met Ant, obviously, in PT school, those three long ass years. So uh, <laughs> yeah, Ant, how, how have you been after after PT school? What you been up to? I've been good. Um, definitely a shift in kind of where I thought I was heading. I think you guys know, I know Ty definitely knows, um, went from being in private, uh, private practice outpatient and uh, thought I was going to be there for a long time. One thing led to another and now I'm back in corporate with the company that I used to work for. Um, but things are good. I can't complain. The transition is smooth and um, here I am now. So is it it's still a select? Yes, I'm with Select. Uh, and then, as you know, your, your former CI, Mark yeah. Martiri, I'm, I'm working side by side with him, which is awesome because he's the man, uh, a lot of wisdom. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been good. No, so what, what made you make the shift from, from the private to, to corporate? Oh, but first, I'd like, um, I wanted to get a, a sense of how you got to be a PT. And okay. Like, like, what yeah. even got you here? I, I, yeah. before we dive like right now into the nitty gritty of what you're doing right now no that's yeah that, that works perfectly because um it actually has to do with martiri with mark um high school i was an athlete soccer player thought i pulled my groin in practice one day went to the athletic trainer said it was a full groin it wasn't turned out that it was a uh, hip labrum tear i had to have surgery um ended up going into pt and i was like all right this is pretty cool mark was my physical therapist at the time and he was a cool dude always talking sports and mechanics and stuff like that um, so he was like, look, I can get you an aid job if it's something that you're seriously interested in. And that aid job happened to be with Select. Um, so I worked in a large uh, clinic with like seven PTs, I think, a couple OTs. So I was flying around all the time, getting, you know, different style of PT thrown at me. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that this is what I want to do moving forward. And then you, you guys know how the rest goes. You got to, you know, grind it out through undergraduate, get all that stuff in, and then, you know, hope for the best in terms of getting into a program and Sacred Heart's where we all ended up. So. Um, that's kind of how it went it's full circle now that I'm working with Martiri too. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you always knew that you wanted to be just into, into outpatient. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I like, honestly, and like what you, what we were saying prior to like actually starting live here, like, I don't think people understand what PTs do enough that they don't know that we're in a skilled nursing facility. Um, they don't know that we're in the hospital. I think the hospital is like the acute care thing. Like a lot of people don't know because when, People ask me about my residency, which are, which is our clinicals. Like I tell them, you know, like I was in the surgical ICU helping people after they had, you know, open heart surgery. And they're like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's intimidating as a student. And a lot of people don't know it unless you've been in the hospital and you needed to be cleared or you've had a surgery or something like that. Um, but I think that part of it's huge. I think that's why our third semester at Sacred Heart is so intense too, because you really can't go in there and, you know, make, make a mistake. Um, but I uh, always thought I wanted to be in OP and then that kind of solidified it through clinicals like, like all our professors tell us. Yeah, right. I think that was pretty much me too. Was like, I didn't even know what, what that PTs were even in the hospital or what they sure. even did. I yeah. remember my, my CI in the hospital was like, so what do you guys learn in, in school? Because clearly I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. I was like, do I exercise mm -hmm. with these people? Do I just walk them? Like, right. I had no idea. Yeah, it's a huge shift. It's a huge shift from outpatient. But um obviously important for us to be there and, you know, see if somebody's mobile enough to go home. And I think like there, there's a lot of pressure on the acute care PT because like if you're recommending something and you're off on it, obviously the doctor has to sign off, but that's yeah. kind of your call at the end of the day. So um, a big shout out to the acute care PT is definitely something I don't see myself doing long-term, but it's a very important piece of what our healthcare model is. So. Right. And also um, I think it's important just to get a sense of, um, the continuum of care of sure. like someone having a total knee replacement <laughs> they're in the hospital um, yeah. they need to see the acute care pt in order to just uh figure out are they safe to go home what exercises right. should they do at home before sure. they go to an outpatient pt mm. so yeah. like during my clinicals it's like all right i see them immediately after surgery and then they go home and then now working in an outpatient uh, clinic, now I know what they went through, kind of no. where they've been at, the pain that they could have felt. It's right. It's, um, 
it gives you appreciation for for the patient and what they're dealing with their feelings their vulnerabilities and then as you like all right this is what i've seen and this is how uh we should progress yeah no absolutely i think that's something too like even in outpatient too like like if i'm doing a technique on somebody i almost sometimes will go to one of like the pts i'm working with and be like yo can you just do this on me real quick because i want to know what they're feeling so that's a good point that you bring up like how much pain was that person in day one post-op and then you know then they go they get home care pt and then they come in op you don't know what their story is because you haven't seen them throughout so having a little bit of background on how how much uh i guess like pain and discomfort they've been through and like mental pain too is is important for us to understand that for sure i think you touch on a pretty huge topic of like seeing the whole process like what's their story because i know in school like even still we look at a case in tutorial and be like all right this person's coming in with say knee pain but it was right. like i can work on the structures i think that are related to it but like there's a whole other like realm of what did they do to get that knee pain like what is their daily life like what are their relationships like so it was like you got to kind of put into total perspective and also thinking of like a total knee replacement it was like when they're in the hospitals like is that a, a threatening environment for them that could have impacted their care or like how did the how did the rehab go in the hospital or things like that? I thought it was pretty cool yeah. to see that from all the way from the beginning portion. So it was yeah, like, that's, it's not just a total knee that's coming in. That's a solid point too, about like, is it a threatening environment? Like, I mean, nobody really wants to be in the hospital, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, going in there, even if it's just, you know, I guess surgeries these days, we can call them quick for like a total knee or a total hip. Yeah. But like just being in there probably already puts the patient in a kind of like, you know, down, down level or down regulated mood. And that's going to impact their care going forward. So it's an awesome point as well. Yeah, that happened to me. So it was, uh, this was the first patient that I got in the acute care setting that of I was course. by myself. I was like, the uh, there, that's always myself. how it goes, man. <laughs> <laughs> right before lunch. And she had a total knee replacement. I was like, cool. All I got to do in there is get her to go from the bed to the chair and we'll be solid. No, like yeah. total knee replacement, no illnesses, no nothing. Come to find out though, she had a history of incontinence. But so it was like from the blood loss that she had from that and a history of incontinence. When I yeah. went to go move her, she turned from like white to just straight pale. Yeah. To the point where it was like she had lost so many fluids. And it just shows you, it was like, I went in there thinking this is going to be an easy total knee replacement. And then all of a sudden she had to get like the whole rapid response team in there because she lost so many fluids from that's, the incontinence yeah, that's, and that's, the blood. That's crazy, man. I think that's a big thing too. Even again, tying it into outpatient, like you go in, <clears throat> you see on the script, like, you know, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, and you're like, oh man, this is straightforward. And then you go in and they're like, yeah, well, I had, you know, surgery six months ago on my shoulder that I didn't recover appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> you see on the med history form, they have anxiety and depression. You're like, all right. So this oh. just went from an easy, straightforward exam to like it need, needing to be a lot more holistic. So that's the, I, I never assume anymore. If it goes really easy, I'm like, all right, cool. That went yeah. super simplistic. But when it gets more involved, like you got to stay on your toes and be ready. hundred percent. So I think I kind of want to transfer into, so what was your first year like of, of treating an in, in outpatient? Did you notice any difference between um, like school or clinicals into like your first year on your own? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would definitely say my first year on my own, obviously, again, it's been like a little like non-traditional because I've already changed jobs, which, you know, I, I don't think a ton of people have done already. Um, so I, I have to give a huge shout out to my old boss, my old CI, Craig, he was like phenomenal in helping me, helping to mold me at, as a PT and like, um, really helping me to like, look at the entire picture and break down mechanics really well. And, um, not always going traditional textbook style of like, oh, like you need to do this special test, like right here, like Hawkins Kennedy needs to be exactly here with this amount of degrees of internal, like just kind of, kind of molding it towards the patient and like putting your own flair on it. So I would say that's my biggest thing now is I'm not super robotic in the way I treat and the way I do an eval. Every now and then, like I'll, I'll watch a patient just like move in the clinic and I'll be like, I don't even think I really need to test knee range, range of motion right now. But for insurance purposes, I do it very quickly. Um, so I would say putting my own flair on things has gotten a lot more simplistic. Um, and then just kind of finding myself as what I wanna be moving forward. I feel like it's still a huge growing process. Like every day I'm finding something new about myself in the way that I treat, that's going to help me to treat for the long term. So I would say that's the biggest thing so far. Yeah. Shit. How about you, Pat? How's your first year been? Woo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of been a whirlwind just uh, yeah. going in. 
it it feels it, it feels like I'm still a student um, to sure. the point because it's like all right I'm treating but like no one's checking what I'm doing. Everybody, yes, um, it's it's just you and the patient, and it's like all right, I'm trying to be as thorough as I can. Yeah, um, just so I don't miss anything, and I was like I'm always like kind of that feeling of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I was like all right, someone's gonna expose me or not exactly knowing what I'm doing at this moment. Right. Um, but it's kind of uh, been nice to like work through those difficulties. And um, now I, I guess kind of eight, nine months in, mm -hmm. um, trying to feeling more comfortable, uh, just realizing, especially I think it was a bonus being in the Northeast for, for a little bit there, a little bit or around, uh, or in the New England, everybody's so abrasive. They're like, yeah. <laughs> all right, what are you, what yeah. do you want to, so what can you do for me? Right. And, <laughs> and so yeah. being used to like, all right, just, all right, this is what I'm thinking. This is, this is what we're going to do. If you want to get your shoulder better, you got to do this, this, and this. Yeah. The get after it method. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. At, and so and I just bring that to where I'm here now in, in California. It's just like, as soon as you come down to me, this is what I see. This is, um this is how I, I plan to work through the plan of care and this sure. is what it is and so you can either do it or i'll be glad to uh refer you to another physical therapist or to another clinic right yeah <laughs> and so it's like all right look if if you don't trust me that's fine we can find someone that that, that fits you so um that feeling of i have to form to um uh, to for you to like me is, is kind of fading away. And this is kind of, this is what it is, but still trying to be there for the patient and be open and receptive and make them part of the plan. It's, it's not just me, but it's like, all right, but this is yeah. generally how this is going to go. I feel that, man, you're not going to be able to fix, you're not going to be able to fix everybody. And that's what you learn as you go forward. So I, I, I love that you said that for sure. Yeah. What about you, Ty? Um, yeah, but I also just want to add, just taking a yeah, go ahead. crap ton of, uh, uh, continuing education courses so like yep. shopping uh istm uh, i just took a ipa functional mobilization course there's so much to, to learn now that's as much as i'm learning now it feels like dang what did i learn in school yeah honestly <laughs> I, yeah no nah, you're, you're you guys are 100 percent right man learning never stops every day grind uh, all right so it's it's been it's been a, a a pleasure just to work through the process of getting comfortable um, being a physical therapist and settling into what does physical therapy means to me. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Go ahead, Tyler. What has right. it been like this first year? It, it's been it's kind of just ups and downs. Like I think in the beginning it was hard when I was studying for the boards and working because I was like I'm learning this base level information for for the board, but I was like this is not helping me for for work right now. So I felt like I wasn't able to really help as much at that point. But yep. like you said, just getting the fir first year, I feel like learning not that you're not not everyone's gonna like you i was like and i think it's just kind of molding how you want to be to the point where it was like same thing with like the relationships that we talked about it was like boundaries is like i will help you but there's only a certain amount amount that i'm willing to let you walk over me for so right. like for me now what i've done is like hey i'm gonna tell you all i know about and i know you're pretty big into this into pain science so i was like yeah. i'm gonna give you some stuff to read i'm gonna tell you what i know about it um, right. but it's on you to do the homework. If you're one of those yep. people that says, eh, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. I already know that you're probably not going to be a good fit for me at some point in this line. So I was like, I'm going to give you stuff to do on your own. Cause I only have you for max, what, one and a half to two hours a week. I was like, right. you have the entire week to mess that up, whatever we did in that little bit of time. So the onus has really got to be on you. So I think for me sitting down with myself and being okay with people won't like me some of the times based off yeah. of how I want to treat. So I think that's what yeah. the first full year was for me was like, all right, what do you like and what are your boundaries and what are you willing to let people kind of like tell you? Cause my problem in the beginning, I think was I wanted people to like me. So they'd be like, Oh, my back hurts. Can you work on my back? And like knowing what pain science is, if they think, Oh, if I work on their back, it's going to get better. But at a certain extent, like you didn't go to school for this. So it's like, why are you telling right. me where to treat you? So sure. like balancing that fine line for me has been tough, but yeah, it's man. getting better. 
that's it. That's well, uh, you know, 1% better every day, but yeah. I, I like, I like, I like, <clears throat> I'm in Fairfield with select. So, um, you know, like Pat said, everything's a little bit more fast paced. We're in the Northeast. Things are fast paced. So like just being able to almost install like a Calif- California based, like relaxed um, treatment, yeah. I think is important. Just like, you know, like you were just at work for eight hours and like your neck hurts, like, let's just chill. You got to, you're, you're a couple minutes late. It's not a big deal. Like, let's yeah. just relax. Let's get through the treatment. If you relax a little bit more, I promise you again, that pain science, like it's gonna, your, your pain levels are gonna come down. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I try to do as well. But when things get fast paced as a PT yourself, you gotta be able to bring yourself down too and say, all right, let me just take a break here real quick, clear my head. And then I'll be, you know, if I, if I'm doing better, my patients are gonna do better too. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Interesting enough, uh, you, you bring up that point. Uh, I had an eval a couple of days ago and I was wearing some jade beads on my on my wrist and she was like oh I like that and she and then she was like all right make sure after um after I leave you take a moment and just cleanse yourself of of my energy and like she was telling me yeah. this I'm just like <laughs> damn <"Wow." laughs> I was like I appreciate it uh, yeah but, and because she was a hand uh she just had uh, surgery on her hand and she comes yeah. to the clinic and I was and I told her I was like we do not have the the I don't have the expertise to to get you better I will feel I feel you should go to a hand therapist or OT yeah uh, and then so at that point she was like okay thank you for just being upfront honest uh and then she saw the bees and gave me that bit of advice and so right. she was like, yeah, I, I probably won't ever see you again, but like, make sure you cleanse the energy. Every time you touch someone, every time you're taking in their energy, their right, moods, which could be super amped up, they're in a vulnerable place. And so she was like, hey, make sure to protect yeah. yourself well. Which there's, is very important. there's definitely a lot of psychology behind what we do, like yeah. 100%. Like we get, you know, you have people come in and they're in pain and they'll dump things on you. Like I have a classic fibril patient right now and she comes in and when I'm doing my manual on her, it's 10 to 15 minutes of her just unloading like what's going on in her life. She probably needs to go see a psychotherapist. Um, so I'm starting to get more comfortable, <clears throat> excuse me, with those conversations as well. Like somebody who might be a little bit overweight or they're smoking like that used to just be a big thing of like, I didn't feel comfortable to step in and say, Hey, I think this might be impeding your progress. Like I'm not trying to be rude here, but your knee pain might be caused because you have a little bit of excess weight. If we can yeah. try to bring that down a little bit, it's going to help. Same thing with fibro. Like maybe you go see a psychotherapist and you talk some things out. And again, if you can get that mental a little bit better, the physical is going to follow. Um, but I'm telling you, dude, it's like well, I'm doing my manual and it's 15 minutes of me being like a social <laughs> worker almost. It's um, yeah. so for what they do and like we're constantly getting a lot of negative stuff dumped on us and we're still there we have to put a smile on our face we have to be better for the next patient it gets challenging sometimes and i think that's why a lot of pts burn out quickly i don't think it's the physical i think it's more the mental so and i know you guys are big on it too just like exercising for yourself doing things for yourself getting out for a walk and going to the beach for 15 minutes getting outside for lunch like you have to take care of yourself you're not going to be able to take care of everybody else as you go forward um it's huge Right. I want to uh, have it back to, uh, so you made a career change or, or a job change already. So kind of yeah. like, what, what led to that? Where were you at right after school and where are you at now? Yeah. So right after school, I, I took the job at Optimal. Um, it's a small cash-based facility. We saw some out-of-network insurance. The business model was set up where it was one patient per hour, um, which is awesome. Like every patient that comes in, you get to spend a lot of time with them. You get to break down mechanics. You get to talk to them. Um, but for me, my biggest thing was I wasn't, and I, and I was with him for two clinicals as well. The biggest thing for me was I wasn't getting enough variation. So I wasn't seeing a lot of post-ops. I wasn't seeing a lot of neuro patients. I wasn't seeing concussions. Um, I wasn't seeing the scope of what we do as PTs. It was a lot of weekend warrior stuff, um, the occasional high school athlete. So I felt as if, um, as a young clinician, I needed to kind of diversify myself a little bit and see all of that. Because for being with him for two clinicals, again, like I didn't see a ton of stuff coming in. So, and also just the pace a little bit, like the one patient an hour, again, it has great benefits, but as a clinician, sometimes it's almost too slow. 
where I started to almost feel as if I was more of a massage therapist than I was a PT. It was 30 to 40 minutes of manual on every patient. Um, so I thought that it was just a little too slow for me and that I needed to get my hands on um, a lot more post-operative. And now I'm seeing concussion and I'm seeing vestibular and Mark's teaching me how to, you know, examine a vestibular patient and then, um, you know, treat them, not just baseline, like taking everything into factor. Um, so that was really at the top of my list as to why I made uh, the, the switch. And it wasn't easy either because I was super close with my old boss. I still consider him a great friend. It took me probably two weeks to finally come to the decision that I needed to make a move and a lot of advice from uh, many PTs that I've known throughout my career, obviously my family and then my girlfriend, we just thought it was the best move for me right now. What's it been like now that you're at more of the corporate fast pace? Because I know select when I was there, we were seeing a couple of people <clears throat> per hour. So like, what was the sure. difference for you in seeing one person per hour to maybe like two, three? Yeah. So I'm super big on like, I like it to be at that two spot. Um, Cause for that, I could, I, I still get my hands on every single patient unless they're super young. And I like, I just know that they just need their ex. Like they just need to, you know, strengthen themselves up. I still get my hands on every single one of my patients. That's huge for me. That 10 to 15 minutes of building that rapport, letting them speak a little bit. And then actually feeling the physiological tissue um, is big, but I'm able to do that while directing another patient to do whatever exercise it is that they, that they do. Um, so definitely a significant change in pace, but it's nothing that I feel like I can't handle. Um, and select is very good about like, if you feel like you are being overloaded, like just let us know and we can send a PTA over to help you out. Um, or we can limit you to just two an hour. Uh, so uh, they've been very, very good to me. And probably a little bit better to me than, than um, and everybody else, just because I worked for them for seven years. So they know me, I know a lot of the people within the company. So they know that if I'm speaking up and saying something that if they help me, it's going to benefit the clinic. So they've been awesome to me so far. Oh, nice. I know you also have your own company that you just started. How's that been? That's been, um, it's been good. It's been fun. Um, the reason why I went to like, so I was just going to kind of do it on the side, not launch like an actual LLC or business or anything like that. But exactly what Pat said, if we're in Fairfield County, people want to see like, they want to see a website, they want to see you have like some merch, they want to see that you're like more official. Um, so I decided to like go a little bit bigger with it. And with this, I'm trying to target like the aftercare. So okay, like you just had a kid who, you know, tore his ACL, he's nine months in pretty much returned to sports stuff, but insurance cut him off. That's the kid that I want coming to me in my own company. I want to say, okay, you, you're a return to sport and you need to be able to jump. You need to be able to cut. Your hip is still slightly weak. You still have some valgum when you're doing X, Y, and Z. Like that's the guy I want to become in this area. And I want people to come to me saying, all right, this is my second knee operation. I don't want this to happen again. Help me. So that's, that's where I'm targeting right now. And I've so far, so good. I've been pretty busy, almost too busy, where I'm starting to have to like nice. figure out what I need to do to spend more time with my family and balance the social life. Oh, and sounds like you uh, you can use another PT under you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe one day uh, in, in the future. But um, yeah, that's been the biggest thing is just like kind of balancing, you know, life and working a full time job and doing like the personal training. It's more personal training with the physical therapy mind on. Yeah. Like, all right, let's, let's work them hard, but like what's breaking down in their, their mechanics and their cutting and their jumping that might put them at risk when they're on the field or on the court um, or whatever it may be. So um, it's a nice change of pace and it's been a ton of fun. So. Yeah. How, how do you create that boundary for yourself to spend time with family? What does that look like uh, or spend time with family or spend time with yourself and with your personal relationships? I think it's just having to say no sometimes. So, um, you know, if you have a patient, you might have to wait list them um, for like the personal training side of things or uh, in the select model, being open with your higher up saying, look, I, you know, I'd appreciate it if my hours looked like this rather than this, because I need some more time to, you know, hang out with my family or see my niece, hang out with my girlfriend, take my dog for a hike, whatever it may be. Because again, if you're not doing that stuff for yourself, you're not going to be able to be great in your full time job. You're not going to be able to be great in your part time job. And then you just kind of, you'll, you'll start to burn out. So I think therapists that are out there that are burning out, whether they're three years in, four years in, five years in, you almost have to look at yourself a little bit and say, am I doing enough for myself to make sure that I can, again, go out there and give what I need to give to my patients? So um, yeah, saying, saying the word no is, is huge. Yeah. 
I, I've been, um, I recently downloaded the Calm app. I've been going through like those daily meditations. Um, yeah. Just getting outside, getting in a routine of exercising. Even if I don't want to go, I just at least just like walk into the gym and just just be there. Sure. <laughs> Even yeah. Just, like stretch or just like walk yeah. on the treadmill for five minutes. But I, I guess I have it nice because I was like, all right, I made it to the gym. I'm just going to go to the beach right now for like an hour before I have to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, at least at least it's something. Yeah, at least at least it's something, dude. You got to give yourself something. So what about you, Ty? Um, For me, the boundaries, yeah, saying no, but also just making sure that I feel like I can handle a lot of stuff throughout the day if I take the time for myself to like kind of get that that reboot. So for me, it's going to the gym and just exercising. So it's like sometimes it's nice to just push around some heavy weight and, and get some stress out that way. For me, that's turned into my meditation. And uh, through like a lot of stuff that I've learned now is like, if you're more intentional, I know you talk a big word on that intentional with your workouts, yeah. like the workouts mean more to me now, or like, I can feel certain things that now I'm like, Oh, shit, that's a good cue for me to give my patient when they do this exercise or like, right, I've kind of liked a lot of finding more about myself, and how I move or what the things I like to do, because I've now seen how it helps me in the PT setting. So I'm like, yeah. Oh, shit, when I really went slow during this motion, I felt this, this and this muscle and I have a patient that has a shoulder problem. And I'm like, do they feel that same problem when they go and do this exercise? So I think at least being able to, to focus on myself this year and whether it's movement, whether it's thought process, anything like that, it's helped me during my exercise or during my, my time when I go to the beach, just to be like, what are the thought processes I have or what's the feeling that I have during a certain motion that then helps me in my PT life. And I like, yeah. my problem, sometimes <laughs> I get a little too caught up in the PT realm where I'm like, if I didn't have a good day treating, I don't feel as successful that day. And still kind of balancing that out is like, all right, how do I have that boundary with myself to say, all right, there's sometimes where it may not even be you that's getting the patient better or worse at that point. I was like, it might right. be another additional factor. Right. Yeah, man, that's well said, yeah, for sure. I think um, I'm just gonna jump in real quick. Um, like my goals of training for myself have flipped a lot too. I, I, you know, I'm skinny dude. I've always said, I just need to put weight on. I gotta, I gotta put weight on. I gotta put weight on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm currently trying to put a little bit of weight on like getting in the gym, but I'm also like, it doesn't just need to be training to be big. Like it doesn't just yeah. need to be the heavy lifts, like throw some mobility in, like Pat said, get on the treadmill and just walk for 15 minutes. And then like mobility has been really big because if you're just always strength training, you're going to feel all locked. Everything's hypertrophied. Your joints yep. aren't going through full ranges of motion. So just throwing some of that stuff in and just saying, all right, it's okay to have a couple of days where you're just in the gym to make yourself feel good. Because one, you're going to feel better. Your mental is going to be clearer. And then longevity, like you're going to be able to do more longer if your joints can move appropriately. So um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Focus on yourself and figure out what your goals are. Right. And that even shifted towards... Uh, um, so the more I look into strength training for myself, uh, mm -hmm. meditation for myself, I, I also tell my patients what I'm doing. Like a lot of some, for most of my sessions, I start with just diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah. Just to calm down and just to just get in a state to uh, get the body ready for healing or just being able to be in a more acceptable, accepting state. Sure. Yeah. I think that's huge. Yeah. Cause day to day, like I'm, I'm frazzled. <laughs> well, yeah, man. And so trying and try before each session, before I start, before I put my hands on the patient, I was like, all right, we're both going to take a deep breath right now. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, cause I want to be receptive of everything you're saying verbally and then non-verbally as well. And if I'm constantly thinking about, all right, everything else trying to already make changes to your plan of care of what we're going to do today yeah without even taking in what you're telling me it's not going to be beneficial for the both of us and then on their side of things if if they're thinking about their day they're just amped up of uh, anything else all right they're not going to listen to what i have to say and and the things that we're trying to focus on in therapy or why we're doing specific motions or do you feel the glute medius activate when you're doing a right hip abduction or whatever? So it's like, all right, we're just trying to be aware and be in the moment. 
Sure. Yeah. So many decisions that we make in such short amount of times. And while making those decisions, you have to be personable and talking to your patient at the same time. So there's so many quick, like little things that we have to be able to do to like buy some time or to be able to multitask and talk while we're thinking, all right, like, where am I going next? They're not doing better, you know, three weeks in, like, what do we do? Like you said, to change the plan of care. Um, Definitely a balancing act for sure. Yeah. Taking that breath and just like being (laughs) in the moment. And the things that everything that you do outside of work will affect work. So you just, yeah, gotta, in a good way or a bad way. So at least try to make it good. Absolutely. Yeah, I saw, well said. Uh, one of my, one of the classes <laughs> I'm taking right now that you'd like a lot of the stuff talks about like pain science. So they, they pretty much put, um, they looked at studies with low back pain. It was like, who's most likely to get low back pain. So they went to like, did a study for over three years following these same groups of people. And they found out, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. One of them was the risk factors was had nothing to do with movement. It was smoking was one of the risk factors. The other one was job dissatisfaction. So it was like of anything else, it was like nothing about hip mobility, nothing about foot, any, no physical thing. It was like, if you don't like your job, something that simple, your body knows a way of, of making you not do it or making you uncomfortable. So you change your body or change your, your habits. So it was like, if I give you back pain, you're less likely to go to work or you're more likely to take days off or stay in bed. So it was like showing how something like back pain or I don't want to go to my job can really change how you feel or your plan of care. So I try, try to tell people, I was like, all of this matters. So as much as you think you're coming into me for the physical part, I was like, that really is just your brain showing you that last alarm system to be like, hey, change something. I don't know what it right. is, but change something. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> interesting and i i think it might have been manny when we started to like dive into the pain science thing gave like the example of you have a patient who comes in they're say a two out of ten back pain just from whatever the pathology might be um and on day one they come in and um you know they had just lost their job or something like that so that two out of ten is going to immediately go up to like a seven out of ten because that pain science is going to play a role but then next week they come back in and they're like oh my god i just won you know a hundred thousand dollars on a scratch off or something like that then that pain is going to shift from a seven out of 10 to even before the baseline to a one out of 10. So like that mental thing of like liking your job or like, you know, just being in a positive mindset or things are going well for you, like that plays a huge role. And I think for us to like get that to a patient is so challenging. Like there's so many walls and barriers put up that we have to break down. It's so hard to get through to them and tell them like why that's so big to bring their pain down. Like it's really, really tough. Yeah, I agree 100%. What it, what what's been your deep dive on to to pain science cuz I know you were starting to get into that like third year. Yeah, I mean I I I need to I need to get into something more structured so I have to look into some of the continuing ed stuff for sure. Um but I would say like application wise like I'm big on like what Pat said. Like I've had a couple patients like the fibro lady I have. I'll have her start with diaphragmatic breathing and that, and like Again, though, it's challenging because you have to explain to them why they're sitting there with their hands on their stomach, yeah. just breathing. <laughs> you know, they, like the, physio- the anatomy and the physiology, like this is going to help them going forward. But they're thinking like, what is this kid having me do? Like, I'm, I came to PT and I'm sitting here just breathing. Yep. Um, so like, it, it, it's really, really tough to get that across. But like, just bringing in the mental side of things is, is huge. Um, and I, I wish there was an easier way to do it. And maybe there is. I just have to learn it. So if you guys got any tips or anything like that, let me know. And I'd be interested to know what that course is that you're, that you're in, Ty. Yeah, uh, Z Health, but that's okay. Do you, do you right, use cool. MedBridge? I do not. I think I did when I was at Motion in one of my um, uh, clinicals, we had MedBridge. But what exactly does that entail? So MedBridge is kind of like a, I used it when I was on clinical at Hill Air Force Base. Uh, okay. We used it for the home exercise program. So we yes. have a list of exercises yeah. so you can send them right to it and they can click on and see a video or pictures right. of the exercises. But also MidBridge has articles and continuing education. Okay. As well, and so they have a, uh, a course with uh, Doc, uh, Adrian Lowe, who is a okay. uh, one of like the big names in pain science. Uh, and so yeah. that's what I actually did my end service on. Like I, I watched like hours of like completed a couple of, of his courses on um, uh, pain science. Yeah. And so, Not- 
And so if you're looking for like the basics of what is pain science, I, I would, that's a good um, place to start. Um, I, and I, I'm blinking on a book, but a lot of it is just trying to recognize, um, explain to your patient, like what is pain? Right. And he used the example of your body is pain is like a um, alarm system for your body. So like a car alarm. So if like something hits your car, like, like if someone threw a rock and hit your car, yeah, the alarm's going to go off. Um, and so as a metaphor for the body, if you have any tissue damage, that right. alarm is going to go off. So it's like, hey, sure. there's, there's something uh, not right here. But, yeah. you know, tissue healing time is, you know, six weeks. So after about six to eight weeks, the tissue should be healed, but the alarm could still be highly sensitive and right. not come back to normal due yeah. to different stressors in your life. Sure. And it's like, how do you tap into that and fix that is like a really, really tough task for us. And sometimes we need somebody else to step in and help. It's like, yeah. it, right. we can't fix everybody, you know? I yeah. think that's huge because... Uh, the, one of the big things of pain signs is like you said, the tissues heal within six to eight weeks. So someone who has chronic pain is like, clearly that structure is not the problem. It right. was like, at some point I saw a quote that was like pain lives in the brain. So it was like, yeah. it is really all in your head, but what in your head is producing that level of threat to say, let me send this alarm. So is it because you can't control that area? Is it because your relationship problems, your vision problems, your hearing something in your body's trying to put the brakes on and say, I don't trust you. Or I don't think this is safe. Sure. I was like, I and think then, people are good. No, I was, yeah, I was just going to say, but then again, like translating that to somebody, yeah. like telling them that like, I'm sorry, but it's centrally sensitized. Like one yeah. telling them what that is like, and, and, and telling that to a patient who doesn't have our expertise and, and information on all this. And then trying to like phrase it in a way to tell them that it's all in your head without saying it's all in your head because it might not just be purely in their head but a lot of it might be driven from like you said stressors in their life it's such a barrier to like kind of break down again it's really tough right. to get that across to people and it's tough because it's like believe it everything is in your head like your yes. whole perspective of life is based <laughs> of, in your head so if i say yeah your pain is in your head like yeah please don't look at me crazy <laughs> right yeah i'm not looking at you crazy i'm like telling you the facts it's legit in your head yeah, right. like, yeah, like everything is. And so, but I think uh, one thing, uh, I know Tyler mentioned this before, he, he, he tells his patients to journal, journal when they fell in pain, what are they doing? When did it come on? And like the, the feelings, emotions that they have during it. Um, and so what, and at, that way is you're getting data points. So they yeah. don't have to believe you. It's like, all right, well, write it down write down every time you feel pain when you're feeling I like pain, that how you're feeling during it because then they can look back and like all right maybe there's a pattern to what's going on here sure yeah no I, I like that a lot um I I like almost smirked a little bit there too because I could just see some of my patients coming in with like a full ass journal <laughs> just for like you know like 12 p.m they write down like a four paragraphs and then 1201 yeah. p.m there's another three paragraphs I could see that but I, I also do think that's like really intelligent because um if, if you can kind of start to pinpoint and like lock in, like what's actually bringing on their pain, like maybe we're thinking it might be purely postural with them with uh, patient X. Right. Um, but then you start to see that they're journaling that it's when, you know, their newborn baby's crying in the middle of the night or, um, you know, something went wrong in the job. And then you start to think, okay, maybe it's postural and centrally sensitized as well from the information that they're giving. Because when you ask a patient to describe their pain, sometimes you can't even get like, you know, the pain scale, the zero out of 10, you can't get, is it an ache? Is it acute? Um, so I think that journaling thing would be huge because then they can really put down some good information of when that pain came on, what it kind of felt like. Um, and that can help us to create a better plan of care for them. So I might try to install that with some of, some of my patients. You got to, I guess, pick and choose though, correct? Yeah, you got to start. Yeah. I feel like start slow with it. My One of my things also is like, so yes, the journal, but I'm like, if you read. So I'm like, read, I'll, I'll give some of my patients books and some of them won't read it. And I'll, I'll tell them like, listen, this is your health that we're trying to help. If you can't find 10 minutes throughout the day, just to read two pages of a book, anything like that. I was like, that shows me your level of determination to getting better. So right. I try, I've stopped taking the ownership so much. And it's like, I'm supposed to be just a guide. 
and kind of tell you where to look for information or how to process certain things. I think going forward, one thing that I would love to have is people come in to a PT session, like we've always talked about, like a physical, like annual physical, just Mm -hmm. to understand maybe not physically, how do I go through things, but how do I understand pain and when it does come on or like, where do I look to, to kind of like track these things? I think that's a, one thing I would like to see going forward, maybe some way I can try to. Yeah, uh, I think the uh, Institute of Physical Arts, um, the IPA course, that they're big on making the patient part of the plan of care. It's like, sure. It's like, I'm only with you maybe two hours out the week. So it's like, this is just as much as a you thing as it is you're coming to me. So it's like, we're both working to get you where you want to be. Right. I think, um, uh, sorry, Pat. I think um, what Ty just said too, with like the one year physical thing as like a PT, dude, if we get to a point where their PTs are like in with your PCP, like your actual medical doctor that you go for an evaluation and then a PT is there to also do like a musculoskeletal or pain science type eval, I would be all over that in a freaking heartbeat for a job. Okay. I think that that would be like such a, a good model to start and set forward. Cause if we can kind of put our own spin on things and, and, and do more preventative care rather than reactive care, which again is a whole nother conversation of what our healthcare system looks like, that would be huge for patient outcomes going forward is like, if we can tell them that, um, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll be able to prevent that low back pain or prevent the postural neck pain from your job day to day. Um, I think that would be really, really big going forward, but I don't know if that will ever happen. So we'll, yeah, we'll I guess we'll, we'll see. Create it then. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what we got to do, huh? Yeah, yeah. look, if you got to what? What's what's the quote? Be the change that you want to see. Yeah, start and start knocking down some walls here, right? See if we can get through the healthcare that's system that. a little bit. That and I think one one thing I need to do better at with my patients, I think, is explaining that you have to describe your your pain to me. Saying it just hurts is not going to be good enough because I don't know right. what it just hurts mean. Because I actually not I had a conversation with one of my patients like about like a month or so ago, where she walks around with chronic pain and never told me that. So she's like, so when I say something, that means it's like excruciatingly painful for me. Right. I was like, I I don't know that because I have other people that think soreness is pain. So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. there's so many different things, and I I would like our whole healthcare system to be like hey, this is this type of pain. So like, if you say it's a sharp pain, it feels kind of like this or like maybe centralize it a little bit more to or yeah. standardize it a little bit more to be like, okay, so soreness most likely feels like this, a sharp pain or an ache. So that right. way people are a little bit more on the speaking the same language. Yeah, help me help you. That's yeah. what it comes down to, right? Yeah. It's so tough when it comes to, to pain and, and, mm. and just hearing that someone be like, Look, I'm not the typical pain. I was like, how do you know that? How do you know? Yeah, right. Know? Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, 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 but I do agree. It's like we have to get better at explaining it. Though you don't, I don't feel like you have to be spot on, mm. but you have to be descriptive of enough to know when there's a change to that. Yeah, right. And so you can be able to track change and track progress. Sure. And I think one thing that I've been doing in my evals too more um, is letting them know that like as PTs and it sounds cliche and corny from what we get from PT school, but we are educators. Like I'm not going to be there with you for the rest of your life after these three months of therapy are over. So like, listen to me when I'm, when I'm saying something to you on an exercise, so you can go home and do it consistently. If you are going to do it consistently in the first place, because that's another story too. Um, but just educating them on how you can make this not happen again is important for us to do as well. But again, as you guys were saying, it comes down to how receptive is the patient to like actually wanting to elicit a change by putting in the work. Because in today's society, like people just don't want to put in the work. They want to just come to us. We put our hands on them, maybe throw a couple needles in them and they want to just walk out feeling great for the rest of their lives. And it just if it worked like that, none of us would have jobs. There'd be exactly. a couple PTs <laughs> all over the globe. They'd be fixing everybody left and right. But like, yeah. that's just not how it works. You have to put in the work. You're not going to get there. Funny enough, I was talking to Pat about this. I was like, I realized PT is a lot different than what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was like, I thought people came to you. 
they they stayed consistent with their exercises you did the stuff you discharge them i was like the real world of pt is i feel better okay let me stop going it was like very rarely yeah. do i fully take someone through and discharge them or right. i get them coming back like months later or like a year later with the same problem they were like I was like, oh, do you still do the exercise? Oh, no, I stopped after I started feeling better. I was like, but that doesn't make any sense. If it happened right. the first time, it's going to happen again sure. unless you continuously address these things. Yeah. Yep. I think it comes back to what is health. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, there's no end goal to being, all right, I am now healthy. I am, let me stop. You know, it's like, I have reached this, this point. It's, yeah. It's yeah. like a constant working. You're constantly figuring out what's going on and, and trying to approve every day. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good point is like just bringing in, like, you know, <laughs> you have all these things going on in your life that are putting you down this path of pain, but what are you doing to get out of it? Like, yeah. if you've really been in pain for 10 years, but you're still eating really shitty food, like <laughs> figure that out because I promise yeah. you that's playing a role or, Oh, like your knees hurt because you haven't exercised in the past 10 years, but you decided to try to run a 5k. Like, what do you expect is going to happen? Like yep. start exercising first and then get into that. Like, are you taking care of your mental health? Like all of that stuff plays a role. And sometimes we're just trying to climb up Mount Everest with some of these patients and it just yep. kind of is what it is. You do what you can and you know, you got to live with the results. So, and one of the things that I I've been starting to do more recently that with the journaling part, is yeah. kind of what you say is that intention and i was like what is your intention for the week like what i know where your end goal is you want to be able to run with 10 miles with no pain but right that's, that's far in, in advance what is sure. your goal for this week and i've had so many patients that are just like i don't know i, I just don't right. have one i was like that's not a good enough answer you have to tell me like what do you plan on doing this week or what's a positive thing that you've gotten and someone's like nothing. I haven't gotten anything. I was like, you don't yeah. have anything this week that you can put. So I think for me is changing the mindset of saying, how are you feeling today? Then to say, okay, what are some wins you've had this week? That might be physical. It might be you woke up and went to the gym this morning, even though you had six out of 10 pain, you woke right. up to go to the gym before work. Mm -hmm. Sure. So almost re reframing their perspective is what it yeah. kind of comes down to. And like, instead of looking at the long-term goal of, yeah, I want to run those 10 miles or whatever, just yeah. like, what do you, what do you want to do today? Like, do you want to bring your pain down from a six to a five? Like that's a goal that we should work on day to day. And then yeah. those steps get you to being that 10 mile a day runner. So I think that's yep. solid. Yep. Anthony, I got a question for you. What's up? Pivot. Um, but thinking about uh, seeing all these pictures of the, of the newly grads and yeah, yeah. And graduating uh, any, what are three of things that you would, uh, tell the new grads uh, one thing i would tell the new grads is you know absolutely follow what you love from your clinicals i think that's that's huge um but with saying that it's not it's not everything um just kind of falling into a job that you you think that you're gonna love like you have to ensure that you're sitting down a little bit and like looking at everything that's gonna play a role in your life so that's one thing where I think I made a slight mistake. I, I almost ultra focused on, um, you know, being as good of a PT as I could too soon. And I kind of narrowed my path a little bit when I think it should be a little bit broader your first year in. So follow what you want to do in terms of like, if you want to go outpatient, go outpatient, but make sure, like you said, you're still going to be a student for that first year. So you kind of have to um, also generalize a little bit to ensure that you're going to still learn because you're going to learn over the next couple of years, no doubt. Um, so I think that's huge. Number two, um, Sacred Heart kind of gave it to us. Don't just chase money. Make sure that the benefits that you get from whatever company you're going to are also there because that is important. Like you're going to grow up very quickly. You're going to mature very fast. Um, and that stuff is huge. Having vision, having dental, having a 401k to retire with one day like that is more important than just having that nice number coming out salary wise and then number three which you guys talked about just continuing it like you have to bulletproof yourself as a pt the only way you get better is by putting in the work so take that online course go get your needling certification go crack next if you want to crack next go after what you want to do to make yourself better because there's a lot of pts out there like us that are going to continue to get better so you're going to have competition if you're going for a certain job um, so you want to make yourself as well-rounded as possible nice yeah, like well that. spoken thank like you pat you got your three yeah hit them 
Um, so interesting enough, like I, so your first point was uh, find whatever, um, use what your clinicals to, to go for it. Um, I didn't, during my clinicals there, I never got the feeling of this is exactly where I want to be. Sure. Um, and so that, that was tough for me. I was like, I didn't know where I want to be or what I wanted to do. Um, right. what type of environment I was looking for, but, um, just trying to be open and trying to make a list of, so I guess number one, uh, be intentional. Uh, of what, or just be aware. What do you want? Uh, right. Do you, how many people do you want to see? Uh, what hours do you want to work? Um, those are all things that are important, which I honestly didn't know or didn't think about until I was like mm -hmm. applying to jobs and interviewing, and people were telling me their different hours, or, or ultimately they're asking me how many people I can, I feel comfortable seeing, or what hours I wanted to work. I was like, I don't know. And so, just yeah being aware of what your wants and where you're trying to go. Sure. Um, and then to set a goal, where, where do you want to be at in a year? Where do you want to be at in five? I, Tyler and I was just talking about it, just like creating uh, one, one year plans, five year plans, um, sure. eventually in a 10 year plan. Just to, if that way, you know, you have an idea in order to be a, to be aware, you have to know where you're going. Um, and then the last one is uh, give yourself grace, give yourself uh, some, be patient, you know, be kind to yourself. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's tough out here because you, you feel like you're supposed to know everything. Right. And that, but then it was nice to us in my clinic, we have like eight to 10 therapists and we're, con I'm constantly asking the questions, talking sure. things, and and it's and it's uh, nice knowing that not everybody got everything completely figured out. Like yeah. there's people, uh, the longest tenured therapist at my clinic's been there for ten years, I believe, going on ten years, and, and it's like, I and he doesn't know what's going on every time, but just having a, being able just to take someone through the, through a plan of care and get them better anyway, though yeah. you, you don't have to have everything completely figured out to get someone better. Yeah. I think that's really important. Well said too. No, yeah. I think, uh, like you said, being open, open is, is one of the, the biggest things for me is open to, to different people and seeing what they might have to offer. I was like, a lot of times I've learned more from patients than I've taught them. Or I was like having right. going into that session to say, okay, what can I learn from this experience? Um, I think is pretty important because yeah, I've had patients tell me, oh yeah, the exercise has been helping, but if I do this and this, it helps me a lot more. And I was like, okay, so what did you do? And then I tried it on a different patient. I'm like, damn, that actually worked better than what I planned. So yeah. being open to know like people have different experiences and different knowledge and expertise. So whether that's being open to other therapists, uh, I guess suggestions or even patient suggestions was one of my big things is like, you don't know everything, you never will. So I was like, somebody right. always has something to offer you, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and then having, don't, you're, you're worth more than what you think you are. I was like, these companies are gonna offer you some money or some salary and it's, it's guaranteed low ball of what, what they actually would have paid you. So sure. always go into something prepared. Like if you're going into a job interview, Kind of like what Pat said, know what you want your hours to be, know what money you're willing to, you're the lowest money you're willing to accept, right. actually factor in that plan. Like, what does that, what does $75,000 mean to you? It was like, you have to factor in taxes. You have to factor in your loans. What do you like yeah. to spend? How do you track your money with that? So I think right. seeing that great number after having no money and paying to do clinicals, I was like, Shit, any money looks good at that point. So, but right. just knowing how does that fit you or how does that serve you? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, Never Split the Difference uh, is a great book. Mm. When, when if, if there's anybody out there just wanted to know more about negotiating um, and then just how, how to go into a negotiating and feel like you don't compromise too much of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I would all good. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Ty. Oh, it's just like a big thing for me is I didn't do this in my first job. And I got lucky that a lot of things worked out well for me. 
but like easily could have taken a job and said, okay, I don't, I didn't know that I left money on the table or I don't know what's my absolute limit where it was like, maybe I needed 14, two weeks off. And that was really important for me. And they only offered me nine or 10. And I was like, knowing before I go in prepared, like, Hey, this is an absolute low for me where I need this time for myself. So I think going into those meetings prepared is pretty key. Yeah. I would, I was going to say that I think, you know, with me making the job transition, I learned a lot about like being, like Pat said, like, you like both of you guys said negotiating and stuff like that. Like you're the, you're always going to be making that company money. Like they're going to make money off of your hard work. So like proving your worth and your, and your value and then fighting for it. Like, don't just sit there and say like, all right, just whatever number you put out there or whatever raises the standard. Like if I'm going above and beyond and I'm doing better than the standard therapist, I'm going to tell you that I'm doing that. You can see it from what I'm doing in the clinic and fight for that. Because if not, it's like anything else in this world. People will take advantage of you on their, and they'll walk all over you. Mm-hmm. And I think like you got to just, you know, kind of grow a pair in a sense and speak yeah. up for yourself and put the work in and then better things will come. And then the last thing I'll say on that, on this is um, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. There's been plenty of times where I've done evals and I'm like, holy shit, like I forgot to <laughs> screen. I forgot to screen for this. Like, what am I doing? Yep. I'll walk right back to the patient and be like, look, man, Sorry, but I forgot to do this. I like I, I know you're on heat right now, but as soon as you come off, I got to do this test real quick. It's gonna happen. You're gonna make mistakes. Don't make the critical one because that will like that'll be tough. But you can make mistakes throughout your day to day, and you can recover from them. Yeah, I was talking to Pat about this yesterday. I was like, be vulnerable. I was like, the only way you're gonna get better because if you go into this saying I know exactly what's gonna happen, it was like right. you won't miss a lot. So it was like, be open to not being good. It was like, and that's going to keep your drive because you're like, hey, if I don't feel like I'm good, I want to learn more. And now let me maybe apply these things that I just learned. And I like, shit, they may not work today. They may not work for two, three weeks. But it was like, right, at least setting that to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. I think a really big portion of of being a better PT each time you go into a new session. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I, I do want to ask actually about your, your uh, dry needling certification. Cause a lot of people ask me, they're like, so is that like acupuncture is what they yeah. ask. So I was like, <laughs> if you can go into what that, what the science is behind dry needling. Sure. Yeah. That's like the classic, that's the question you'll get. Are either you guys dry needling certified? California. You can't California. You can't. Okay. So hopefully that'll change. Cause I think it's an incredible tool. Um, so you always get that from the patient is like, I've had acupuncture. Is it acupuncture? I don't know enough about acupuncture to speak on it. What I will say is that there's something behind it. Like it's been going on for thousands of years and it just works. Like people come to me, they said they had it and it works, but dry needling versus acupuncture, just a quick science behind it. Acupuncture is going to be subcutaneous of just in the skin. Um, and the needles go in, it's based off of like meridian lines and energy. And, you know, if you have neck pain, they might be putting needles down in your foot. Um, again, I don't know the heavy science behind acupuncture, but with dry needling, if your neck hurts, I'm going to attack your neck with the needle. Um, so like upper trap is easy example. If you have a, like a top band of tissue, a trigger point, as we're, we're taught in PT school, um, basically needle goes in, you go through the subcutaneous, you go into the muscular tissue. There's a knot needle goes in and that knot typically will twitch response. And it's through the brain and the spinal cord loop that that twitch response is actually the muscle relaxing. And it kind of releases all of the uh, cellular soup that's in there, like the bad stuff. That's what I tell the patients. It's like a, it's like a bad mix of like, um, uh, like energy and um, like cellular crap is what I use sometimes. I know that's the least professional thing you can say, but then when that gets released, the tissue is going to be in its natural physiological length. It's going to be calmer. And also it brings down the central nervous system. So sometimes I actually had a patient recently that um, I needled. She was having hip and neck pain. I went after the neck and then she reported that her hip was feeling better too the next time she came in. And I said, that's not you going crazy. That's possibly because your central nervous system was so heightened and I got it to release somewhere else that everything came down and now your pain in your hip was also better. So I find it to be an incredibly valuable tool. Um, Hopefully California will allow you guys to do it. And I know you guys would probably jump all over the certification um, because it's, it's, you get buy-in instantaneously. Somebody comes in with like the hiked upper trap or something and you stick a needle and they're immediately like this or like, what the hell just happened? Instant buy-in from the patient. Like it's, it's been huge for me. I saw, I had somebody that was telling me about (laughs) 
did they talk about like the up regulating versus down regulating in in the the course that you took i i took it with myerson so he got you know pretty in depth with the pain science stuff um i think it, i think it comes down to who you're gonna uh take it through is, is what it comes down to um but yeah they definitely talk a little up, reg up regulation and down regulation and then pain science for sure so when do you use one versus the other i guess like if someone's coming into you are you more likely to use the down regulating if they're having that like upper trap hike or are you going to go to like say a muscle that you like say lower trap and you wanted to do like right. an antagonist would you up regulate that or would you more likely down regulate like the upper trap i would say from what i've seen it's a lot more down regulation to get that patient to come down to get the sense or like the heightened hyperphonicity to come down what i will say is i don't think clinicians who dry needle use it to upregulate enough. So like if somebody has a super tight hip flexor and you're like, all right, well, obviously we need to stretch or strengthen that hip flexor, but like, why aren't we trying to needle the glutes to activate them more? So like, like you just said, so maybe if we needle that glute bead and we get that to activate and fire better, it's just like by definition, what's gonna happen? Hip flexor is gonna be able to relax a little bit more. Um, so I just don't think it's used enough. Personally, also myself as a clinician, I don't use it enough, but it's something that definitely works. And again, Jay Myerson was huge on like, let's not just use it to bring people down. Like we can get a muscle firing better by putting a needle in there or putting three needles in there. And then it's convincing the patient that I want to stick needles in your butt where they're <laughs> kind of just like, all right, like, what are you talking about, dude? And you got to yeah. try to break it down to them a little bit. So yeah, definitely a good tool. Is there like a map in which they're like, Hey, um, if it's, shoulder pain go after the shoulder or is it like hey there's sometimes we'll find if you go along this this line of of pull and maybe go maybe towards their butt as opposed to their shoulder it was like is there any map like that or is it more so based up to your interpretation i think it's more based up into your in interpretation like i mean i guess now with seeing that patient that i put the needles in the neck and she felt better on her hip i think i'm just going to be more open to just trying to go after anything you guys just hear my dog let out that yelp um <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave it a little bit more open to my personal interpretation. And again, like first year out, it's just, it starts to be the art of like who you want to be as a PT. Now you start to take the tools that you have and you start to add them to kind of your, your flair again. So like, how do you want to use dry needling in comparison to what everybody else does for it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks Anthony. I appreciate you spend, spending some time hopping on with us. Yeah, man. I appreciate you guys having me. And like I said, um, you know, if I, if I get out to Cali to go see a couple of my boys out there, we'll have to get together and, you know, do yeah. dinner and talk some more of this stuff. I'm always down, man. I'm turning into a huge nerd. Like yeah. it's, it's bad. <laughs> That's what I told I'm, I, I'm turning into a huge nerd, but um, it, it, you know, it makes, it makes you better. So uh, oh. it's, it's been fun. Yeah. I, I would love to have some, some more of these conversations with you and just be able just to pick your brain up. So definitely. Sure. Mm. Yeah, man. Sounds like a plan. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, of course, bro. Good seeing you again. Glad you're doing well with your company, too. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks.